Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. Um, I'm one of your hosts, Lisa, and I'm here today with my co-host, Venkat. Hey, Venkat, how's it going? Hey, Lisa. So today we are talking about D for drivetrains. So uh, I think uh, we thought of this topic last time because we were talking about clocks and a clock has a drivetrain in it, at least a mechanical one. So this mm. week we're talking about drivetrains more generally. And for the purposes of this show, we are not talking about like, you know, the drivetrain of a car. So that's an example. We're talking about drivetrains generally. So mm. it can be any kind of um, mechanism where something like a motor or an engine is driving motion somewhere else, either through a set of gears or a pulley or a chain and are transmitting motion over a distance. So that's a drivetrain. So we're going to play a little game where uh, Lisa and I are going to compare examples of drivetrains we found around the house. And mm. we'll see who comes up with the weirdest drivetrain. So Lisa okay. is going to go first. Yep. All right. I'm up first. Uh, OK, I'll share it one at a time, I guess. OK, so first off, I'm going to start off with my, um, this is the Mazda engine block um, from the Mazda car I bought back in July. Um, this is the engine block, but underneath it, it's got a drivetrain. I think this is kind of cheating because um, we've got a, uh, what do you call it? Um, you know, like having a car drivetrain is kind of the canonical example. Um, and this photo isn't really the drivetrain. The drivetrain is underneath the engine block. So um you can kind of see the engine block here but it's like buried underneath it the engine supplies power to the drivetrain which is like runs down the mental middle of the car um my oh so this actually this um this is a limited edition mazda which means it has a slip differential in the back i don't know if we have time to get into a slip differential yeah why don't you give us a quick uh, tldr of what a slip differential is yeah so my understanding is that um so on a car you have like a kind of have like a You've got the power coming from the engine and then there's usually a long shaft kind of like a long stick thing that spins it's a spinning stick that is like the um drive like the shaft drive shaft and then at the back of it you have another spinning stick attached to it which is the back axle um and so typically what you want to do is you want to spin the back axle using the spinning stick that comes out of the engine um mm -hmm. so the uh the the problem is that's fine when you want to go straight you want to apply the same amount of power to both uh wheels in the back so you want the stick at the back to turn at the same rate as you go straight but when you turn on a corner the outside wheel is going to travel a farther distance than the inside wheel is so if you keep them spinning at the same rate you'll get some like um kind of a power to, like a slippage on the internal yep. one because it doesn't need to travel as far and the other one needs to travel farther so a limited slip differential um, basically allows the um, amount of power that gets applied to each of the wheels to, to differ to differ so that an equal amount of like power basically so the the wheel on the outside goes faster than the wheel on the inside when you turn but at the same rate so that you get the same amount of power applied to both wheels to return um, yeah cool. and I think that I forget this is like ancient memories for me but when you get stuck in the mud or something I think the differential is what uh, uh, allows you to get out of the mud because the two wheels are sort of independently driven yes. and one does not have to have the same torque as the other. Uh, right. But speaking yeah. of differentials, one of the interesting things about electric vehicles is that um, electrical machinery is in general way more simple than mechanical machinery. So right. some uh, companies are trying to do independent uh, wheel motor drives. So I think Lordstown is trying to build EVs, but each wheel has its own independent motor. So you don't need a differential. You just drive each motor independently. So it's they each have their own individual yeah. drive trains. Once four spinning sticks instead of one spinning stick. <laughs> yeah. Per, so per instead engine. of like a mechanical drive train, you have basically four electrical connections to motors, and then it's a simple mm -hmm. drive train, one motor per wheel. All right, what's your next example? All right, what do we got next? I have, um, oh, this one's pretty simple. And staying in the garage, uh, we've got the bike, bicycle drivetrain. Uh, <laughs> it's got a, uh, basically, you know, you turn the power here and then you use a chain as your drivetrain that turns the back wheel. So you can see the chain here. You're taking um, all the easy ones. <laughs> yes, a hand bank hat, that is correct. You give me like five minutes to find my examples. Um, also in the garage, I had the, uh, I don't know if this actually has a drivetrain. I'm assuming this is a drivetrain. Well, yeah, kind yeah, of. Yeah, it does. So it's just a yeah. power drill, right? It's not it's a, a drill. power drill. Yeah, okay. I've got a power drill. So I've got- Oh yeah, and it has multiple speeds. Drill. It goes up to 11? Yeah, I guess so. I don't actually think I use the speeds all that often. Maybe I should. Um, 
but yeah, it's my, my handy dandy Black & Decker uh, power drill. Um, let's see what else have we got. Uh, I've got a, oh, I've got two more. Okay, this one's in the kitchen this time. Um, it is a immersion blender. Can you see that? All right, yeah. Okay, this one I great. think is probably um, doesn't have any reduction as, as far as I can tell, it's just a straight uh, uh, single speed, but it moves uh, motion over a distance, so it counts. Moves motion right. over distance, yes. The motor is in the handle and the spinny part is down at the bottom that you stick in the soup or whatever you're trying to blend. So um, my immersion blender uh, has a bit of a questionable amount of drivetrain. Uh, questionable. <laughs> and then the last one I'm pretty excited about. I kind of wish I had gotten farther on this project so I had a more, more different um, thing to show. But um, I guess I'm going to show my whole screen. I'll show part of it. Okay. So I'm building a clock. I'm going to show you the clock first. So I'm building, I'm not building a clock. I'm sorry. I'm building a mechanical model. I'm building this windmill. Um, and part of the windmill, um, to get this from you, Gears, it's a big wooden uh, windmill that you build. And part of it, it has a, um, the, it has a, a chain link drive chain that I have to assemble. Um, from wooden links, so. This is gonna be um, really cool when it's done. Yeah, it's gonna be really cool when it's done, uh, but I haven't finished it yet. I've like basically done like one gear. I've done one of these gears. There's like A4 and A3 here in this photo um, that the chain link goes on to, and I've built like one of them. And I still have to do like a whole lot of other stuff to put together before I get to the chain link part. But. Yeah, um, yeah this, uh, the assembly sort of uh, model seems similar to the clock I built with like you know, a bunch of sheets pinned together with like a steel pin. Uh, but the chain mechanism looks kind of like um, fragile and precarious. So I'll be interested to see how you progress <laughs> building that because I, I had like trouble it. with my clock with some of the more delicate push fit things. So mm -hmm. this is, I think in, um, at least in the dry train part, more complex than my clock. So uh, yeah, we should revisit it's... this when we get to W for windmills. We definitely should. It's, it's, I think, one of the most complicated models that this company sells. So it's definitely on the more advanced level of um, mechanical parts built out of um, punch out wood pieces. So I'm excited to see how it goes. Um, it, right. It's kind of cool. They actually give you like some wax and some sandpaper. And on certain parts, they're like wax and sandpaper, this part, so that yeah. when it turns, it like turns nicely. So. Either I had not. that too with the clock, with the escapement wheel that uh, I showed you last time. So you have yeah. to wax the escape wheel because that part is the high friction thing. Yeah. Cool. All right, my turn. What do you got, Venkat? Yeah, show us, show us your goods. What drive trains do you have? What are you bringing? All right. So the first one is just the one I showed last time, the drivetrain of the clock. So this is a drivetrain of eight gears that reduces from like, you know, one second oscillation pendulum to um, 12 hour dial, right? So that's quite a big reduction for a clock. So that's my first one. My second example is basically a home printer. So people don't uh, think about this, but a printer has to pick up a sheet of paper from the paper tray, feed it through a bunch of rollers and put an image on it and push it out. And there's a motor that drives that whole thing. So there's a bunch of rollers and little gears that move the paper along. Um, I worked at Xerox for several years, so I actually know a little bit about this technology. And this um, is like entire organizations dedicated to designing this part of the printer. It's called the paper path. So yeah, it's, it's a fairly complex mechanism. I tried to see if I could open up a part to show view, but uh, I couldn't. But for really uh, complex printers, that can, this can get really weird and funky. Like there's a uh, Xerox at one point was doing a concept called uh, TIP, I think. Uh, it's basically multiple parallel pr printers where it's like, you know, parallel processing like multi-core processors. So you have a single paper tray, but you have like four what are known as uh, print engines. And you can, if you wanted to print say four copies, one would go to each of the cores, so to speak. And they would have a complicated paper pad that can like feed the paper into all four and then collate and things like that. So paper pads can get really complex and a buddy of mine used to like um, design them. It's like designing roller coasters basically. All right, so that's my second example. Third example, I couldn't get a good uh, picture of this, but this is the underside of the build tray bed of my 3D printer. So that's a two direction, uh, two axis uh, bed, basically. It moves in X and Y directions. And then the nozzle that deposits the plastic um, 
is the z axis that goes up and down. So the two x and y axes are driven by a motor and I think a belt drive. I kind of saw a tear down picture of this printer, but yeah, I think it's a belt that drives the tray in two directions. So that's my example number three. All right, example number four. This is a telescope mount. So uh, this is kind of interesting because uh, before computerization, telescopes used to have what's called an equatorial mount where you have like two orthogonal axes. One axis is pointed towards the North star, so the pole star, because the earth rotates around the pole star and you can sort of have the telescope rotating around it. And then the other one sort of moves with latitude. So it's basically latitude and longitude in the sky. And that's mm -hmm. mechanically complex because you have to like point it really. So the point of that is if you're like taking a long exposure of a deep sky object and you need like a five minute photograph, the telescope actually has to track it for that time. And more recent cheap telescopes, uh, there's a inexpensive entry level telescope. They use a simpler kind of mount called an altazimuth mount. So that's basically flat towards the horizon and then vertical. So this mm -hmm. can't track stars as well, but it's basically got uh, two motors that uh, drive it in orthogonal axes and then you can point it at any uh, star. So this, uh, if I remember, it has nine speeds. So it moves very much more slowly than the motor. So the motor is actually pretty weak, but it, can, it moves a fairly heavy telescope. Right, that's my example number four. And finally, example number five, this is our Nordic track. So this one is actually kind of interesting. It has, we just got it uh, for, you know, COVID at home workouts. Yeah, Matt, what, uh, what's a, what's a, sorry, Venkat, what's a, um, what's a Nordic track? Is like a workout device. Yeah, it's uh, basically skiing. It's cross country skiing. So. Uh, oh, I see. Okay. It's not, it's kind of like an elliptical type motion, but those two things you see are basically skis. And uh, it's designed to mimic um, skiing motion. And there's a flywheel in the center and there's basically rollers. And each time you do like a step with the skis, it pushes the flywheel a little bit. And the flywheel, if you can see, has a little belt attached to it. And the mm -hmm. belt basically adjusts the frictional tension. So you can turn a knob, like it's out of the frame, but you can turn a knob that tightens the belt. And that makes it a little harder to uh, do the skiing. Right, so those are my five drive trains. Cool, fun. Are you planning a ski trip anytime soon or is this just No, nope, this is just exercise. I don't think I ever want to ski. All right, so that's drive okay. trains. Those are some pretty exciting drive trains, Ankit. Um, I think like cars are like the most common example of drive trains. I think, well, not common, clearly we've gone over quite a different number of options, but that seems to be the context they come up the most. I'm trying to think uh, if there's anything more ubiquitous than a car. I think actually microwaves might be like in the US, if there's one device that everybody owns, um, more people own than a car, it's probably a microwave and a microwave has a little turntable, right? Yeah. And, uh, oh, uh, my buddy Carlos was uh, just uh, trying to nerd snipe us uh, with a question of what's the optimal rotation rate for uh, a turntable of a microwave? What would you guess? Turn rate? Like it turns, right? So how fast would you want the turntable of a microwave to turn? Wouldn't you want it to be at least like correlated to the microwave like wavelength? It's some, something, I don't know, this is guessing. <laughs> so that you got nerd snipe. This is, that's the path I went down as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, you've got a particular sort of um, resonance frequency and that heats up the water and that heat diffuses in the food and so forth. So you can get very complicated that way. But uh, Carlos, his um, theory is that it's much simpler than that. It's a UX question because most people commonly do 30 seconds, one minute, two minutes, like, you know, multiples of 30 seconds. And you want the thing to rotate so that it brings the handle of the dish back around in 30 seconds. So if you're heating a cup of water for 30 seconds, you want the coffee cup handle to be facing you the same way you put it in. So. Oh. That, that seems like a reasonable place to start so because I think, seconds. yeah. yeah. Uh, that's fun. Oh, that's a really well, fun question. Mul multiples of, uh, or sorry, factors of 30 seconds. Right, yeah. yeah. Be because I think the actual heating sort of thermodynamics part, it's pretty forgiving. You, it just needs to rotate. It doesn't really matter how much. Right. I could totally believe that. Yeah, I could like, it's, it's just to keep it from getting hot spots, right? So that it like. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. 
I think a microwave heats up the first two or three inches below the surface of a food pretty much evenly. So unless mm. you have a very large thing, like a whole chicken in it, it actually doesn't matter that much. But um, yeah, but, all right. Uh, the more can you, you know. think okay. of anything more common than a microwave turntable? What's the most common you think? Oh. Bicycles? Microwaves are not very common in the developing world. So worldwide, I would not say microwave turntables are likely the most common drivetrain. So it sounds like some kind of vehicle, right? Like a bike or a, a car. I would imagine a bicycle is the most common household drivetrain. Okay. I can't think of anything that's likely to be more common. All right. So we can throw that out as a challenge to readers. Can you think of, uh, what do you think is the most common drivetrain in the world? So, I mean, speaking of drive trains, we've got a few minutes left. Um, we were saying that you were saying that you had an analogy that you could make between like the election that's coming up uh, tomorrow and um, a drive train. Yeah, so um, here's my theory, right? So in a very yeah. simple toy democracy, you have like one word counts the same as any other word, right? So in a, like a direct democracy, small city or something, everybody yeah. votes, everybody gets one vote. But in a weird system like the US Electoral College, you have this sort of complication reduction, complicated reduction gear type mechanism, right? Where a really underpopulated state, like I don't know, Wyoming or Montana, yeah. uh, one, uh, one vote by a citizen is worth, I think like almost like three California votes or something, simply yeah. because um, if you look at the Senate or uh, Electoral College effects, they have a lot more leverage. So in that sense, uh, the US electoral system is like a drivetrain that um, creates like by design an unfair and unequal sort of uh, leverage for each state based on its sort of population mm -hmm. and the number 50 arbitrarily. Yeah, electoral college is a drivetrain of the United States uh, presidential election, it sounds like. Um, yeah, not a very good one. So what's going on with the election in Texas? Somebody tried to stop what's being counted, right? Yeah, actually, that was Harris County. It was kind of funny because one of my friends here, so the issue was around drive through voting. The county <laughs> right. commissioner or county judge um, it decided to try and make voting more accessible this year. And one way they would do that is through his drive through voting polling locations. Um, and like I had a friend who she was, you know, texting us excitedly about having done the drive through voting earlier in early voting. And um, I think they had like 130,000 votes that got cast in Harris County through drive through voting. And um, I believe some GOP party affiliates attempted to bring a court case to toss all of those votes out. Um, so those are, you know, those are people who showed up at a polling location, but just did it in their car instead of going into wherever, anyways, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but the, it went all the way to the federal judge and the federal judge tossed it out saying that they didn't have standing to sue, um, nice. which I think makes sense. Like, I think, you know, with any court case, you have to say, like, you have to, I think you have to present what your harm is, like what your like stake in the case is and what harm has been caused or whatever, what your standing is for taking, bringing the suit against them. And a federal judge said that the, whoever decided to bring the thing wasn't huh. a, um, so that, that's an interesting been. ground on which to throw out the case. Like, I think it's illegitimate and basically voter suppression, but it's kind of interesting that that's the grounds on which they rejected it. It's uh, uh, because if you, well, maybe so they're leaving the door open for like different kinds of challenges. Uh, but as you were speaking, it struck me that there's another drive train in elections, like mm -hmm. just access to uh, like voting like mail is the easiest and the hardest right now is standing for hours in an actual, you know, voting line on election day with social yeah. distancing, especially if you're old or ill. So it's like, how easy is it versus how hard is it is kind of another drive train. And literally in this case, a drive by voting mechanism, which is easier in Texas than walking up because it's like, you know, such a big state with so much problem. And everyone has cars here. It's so easy to get in line in your car. I mean, dr yeah, drive through takeout is big here. Like, um, we, we have a lot of infrastructure for car stuff. So it's very easy to get in your car and drive through a thing. And you don't have to worry about parking, which is big. Um, in California, we had sort of a, the opposite problem. Like the GOP was putting up um, random unofficial ballot boxes and labeling them official. 
and there was a, they had like some justification for it and I don't know what they intended to do with it. Like were they planning to toss it out or like somehow accidentally lose them? Uh, I, I don't know quite how it got sorted out, but uh, I think it's still in the courts or something. But oh, uh, we should like do- fraud? That seems fraudulent. That seems it, like you're opening not, yourself up for being- uh, That's what I thought so at first as well, but apparently there's uh, some sort of uh, clause in the election laws that allow people to do this kind of thing. So I'm not quite sure what it is. Uh, assuming that they're like, you know, legitimately somehow part of the electoral process and intend to like submit the votes for counting or something like that. But I don't know because they didn't actually uh, act like they'd been caught in a crime. They acted like they were justified in doing this and everybody was doing it. But uh, yeah. So, uh, oh, and we had incidents of, uh, ballot box burning. So people dropping flaming newspapers inside existing ballot boxes and literally burning down votes. So we had, I think, two instances of that. Seriously? We, yeah. So that's we, incredible. Yeah, I think Boston had something similar too. That's like, yeah, I mean, that's like some amount of like combat warfare against like, wow. Oh, there's a lot of this going on. Like there was a shooting this morning in, where was it? Nebraska, I think. So some guy thought some other people had stolen Trump lawn signs off his lawn or something and he challenged them and shot at them. I think a couple of people are in hospital or I don't know if they're dead, but yeah, so that happened. And uh, somebody shared with me a photograph of a uh, uh, pickup truck with like a um, mannequin or something uh, across the hood in black clothes uh, with the label Antifa on it. So it's like, I'm gonna run down Antifa protesters or something, so yeah. Things are kind of tense. Oh, for those um, listening, by the time this episode gets out, it'll be after the election and hopefully we'll know what the results are. But right now it's November 1st, is it? No, 2nd. 2nd. Second. Today's November second. second. Tomorrow's voting day. Tomorrow yeah. is voting day as we are recording. Yeah. yeah. So in theory, election results will start coming in tomorrow evening, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. This we'll is going to be interesting. Goes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Great. All right. Cool. So electoral well, drivetrain, mechanical drivetrain, any other drivetrain thoughts? Electoral drivetrains that we talked about. Uh, cool. So next week we'll be talking about E and we'll figure out, I guess we'll be figuring out what our topic is soon. Yes. Yeah. You have to figure out what to talk about for E. Maybe Great. something to do with electronics. E -electronics. All right. Sounds good. Cool. Right. Till next time. Bye. Till next time. Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.